It is my pleasure to bring to call to the podium our speaker, Mr. Clive Edwards. Over the years, I've listened to Clive, and I still recall many, at least two, of the messages he has brought to this podium, and one of them um, reminds me, every time I look on street signs, I see a message in them. I don't know if you remember the talk you gave after your trip to Hawaii, I think it was. Oh, right. That is one of them. I won't bore you with the others. That they were boring. So, let me, Clive, Glynis spoke about quiet excitement. Clive, I think, is quite powerful. <laughs> Good morning. I want to thank Carl for that um, PR. <laughs> and so to join Carl in expressing our joy as a part of the team to be here this morning sharing ideas with you on what we spend so much time for our lives doing, which is just practicing the principles of truth. In life, the only thing <clears throat> that we can be sure of is change. <clears throat> change comes at us in such different ways, and change is always coming at us. And the change can manifest itself in a couple of ways. It can be the decisions and the initiatives which we actively and we consciously initiate. But change can also come to us from our own experiences, from circumstances outside of our apparent control. Of course, we know as true students, in truth, everything that we manifest is coming from our own consciousness. We participate in everything that we are manifesting. But in our life journey, we can identify those experiences that we see as major ones in our life, those that we consciously initiate and those to which we respond. And how do we respond to the various experiences, whether they are initiated by us or whether we have to respond to actions initiated outside of our control? I would suggest that there are three common modes of behavior with which we all can identify. One would be action. We make decisions, we change jobs, we change countries, we move homes, we commence relationships, we end relationships, etc. But sometimes, even in matters which we initiate, there is the human potential anxiety. <clears throat> My father in law used to tell me that. Every time I change the job, you just say quietly, you know, rolling stone gathers no moss. Because except for this last assignment, I have never been in on the job for more than five years. And so even when I initiated these changes, probably with more challenging experiences, more money, whatever the positives are, invariably that first morning, as I move to my new area of work, there'll be a nostalgia around my colleagues at the old office. You know, why did I do this? It's been so nice to, to feel the usual, what I know as I go to that space and not having the anxiety I'm feeling as I come these steps. So even when we initiate, the humanness and the naturalness of our human experience comes into play and we have anxiety. Another mode of behavior is resistance, and particularly when decisions are made that are outside our control. Outside, although I think it's outside our control. So you might have changes at work. You could have changed at home. You could have changed in the family structures, marriage, divorce, transitions. The natural 
approaches, we need time to get used to what emanates and what surrounds those changes. Because after all, we didn't initiate those decisions, so we really need time, don't we? That's what the emotional side of us keeps saying. So we need time to accommodate the emotional or the physical that comes from these changes. And of course, the third mode of behavior is acceptance. Whether we made the decisions or they were made for us, we can accept with calm and we can accept with poise what we need to do to accommodate these changes in our lives. And this mode of behavior certainly honors our understanding of what we are in consciousness. That is, we are one with the all-knowing and the all-guiding and the infinite wisdom of the Father that is one with us and whose infinite intelligent consciousness connects with us in a very direct and infinitely ongoing way. So what I want to focus on this morning is how do we maintain the building of this consciousness? This consciousness which is a demonstration of a greater understanding of who we are in God consciousness. When I struggle with the outcomes of change in my life, and I can assure you on occasions I really do. I mean, let me digress a little. Do you know, do you know if you want to know if managing change effectively in your life? Monitor your mental conversations. Monitor the things that you're saying to yourself in relation to change in your life. Is your, con is your mental conversation about dominated by the changes that you're going through or that you're experiencing? Are you doing any frequent visioning of things the way they were? And subconsciously you're trying to go back there? And are you visioning with any sense of nostalgia? I just put that out as a monitor, as an indicator for us all if we know whether we're managing the change in our lives effectively. But anyway, when I'm seeking to build those consciousness muscles around managing change, I always go back to basics. The thing about truth is always so, you can always go back home when you think you need strengthening. And I always reference Ernest Holmes, how to use the signs of mind. And I focus on chapter six, which speaks to spiritual awareness. And this chapter reminds us of the deliberate process that is involved in building spiritual awareness through the process of spiritual mind treatment. And so I've experienced that, and I've titled my message today as the changelessness of change. The changelessness of change. If we refer to page 59 of that very useful text, it says spiritual awareness is important in the use of the law of life, for the law is a servant of the spirit. Our spiritual awareness is a secret place of the most high within us. Our conviction and our faith are the mount of transfiguration where we receive a deep conviction that there is a spirit in man and that the spirit is God. And it continues by saying, since so much in the world contradicts this, those who seek to demonstrate the principle of good must spend much time in the silence of their own thought, gathering into themselves the spiritual energies of the universe. Spend much time in the silence of their own thought, gathering to themselves the spiritual energies of the universe until they become more real to them than that which contradicts them. So 
We know that in managing the inevitability of change in our lives and affairs, there's no shortcut. There's no magic to instantly help us manage the reactions or the actions arising from either planned or unplanned sequence of events. So what? It behoves us to continue doing the very personal work of building that spiritual awareness, which then offers the anchor for our life experiences, whatever they may be. And in Ernest Holmes' text, he offers an example of, a, of affirmative statements on page 62. He says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Today divine love and infinite tenderness sustain me. In order that, that I shall not separate myself from this love, I endeavor to see it reflected in everyone and everything. Here, very wonderful statement that comes up. I shall permit only that which is loving, kind, and the true to find entrance or exit through my consciousness. It means, therefore, that whatever the type of change that we experience in life from time to time, we can only allow ourselves to see only the loving, the kind, and the true, and allow that and only that equivalent into our consciousness. This is how we deal with the potential of fearing the unfamiliarity brought about by change. And this is how we can eliminate those mental conversations that would introduce anything that is opposite to truth, to kindness, and to love. On page 66 of this text speaks to the ultimate effect of building that spiritual consciousness through a spiritual mind treatment. And it says, in treatment, we bring our highest concept of life to a focal point, declaring that since life is unconditioned, since life is whole, since life is forever flowing, it is flowing in the right action through the person, place, or thing we are thinking about. And concludes by saying, in this way, we bring heaven to earth. In this way, we bring the highest possible ultimate of our consciousness to the form and affairs of our lives that we're working with. In this way, we bring heaven to earth. In this way, we bring consciousness of the highest level to form. On page 67, it concludes by saying, the trust in this presence is the highest form of sanity. Isn't that wonderful? The trust in this presence is the highest form of sanity. To feel that it is guiding us is normal. To desire that the divine mind shall project itself in our thought and actions is natural. Everyone should train themselves to listen deeply to the spirit which spontaneously flows through their own being. To trust in this presence is the highest form of sanity. And everyone should train themselves to listen deeply to the spirit which spontaneously flows through their own being. So as we go to that silent place and we experience the most high of our consciousness, we also are able to listen to what spirit is telling us, our own message, unique to us, unique to our own experience, unique to our own direction unique to how best we operate at a high consciousness in form and appearance. So the work that we have to do is to build that spiritual awareness 
and normalize for us the idea that the guidance of spirit to our highest good is normal. And the sound of our spirit is unique to each of us. And that we have confidence to follow it in our path of cascading spiritual growth. I bet you knew everything that I just said. I bet you did. But I also bet that there are moments when, like me, you struggle with managing change, which is always around us and always dealing with us. Permit Elmo always said, be careful of the things that excite you. When you get a feel in your belly button, you may get a call. You may see a document. Someone might tell you something. Be careful of the things that excite you. It's telling you something. It's telling you where you are with how you're choosing to manage something in your life. Watch the nature of your mental conversations. And particularly during times of change and stress, Monitor any changes in your physical conversation. What are you talking about more than you normally do? Are you talking about something more than you normally do? Monitor it. If there needs to be any incentive for the deliberate, the detailed, the steady work that we need to do in building spiritual awareness, it is a reminder that change is always at work in our lives always at work in our lives. Those that we initiate and those to which we respond. And there's no magic potion to help us to manage this process. The way that we manage this process is the continuous work that we do in building that spiritual awareness and building that spiritual consciousness and being disciplined about going to that high place and understand who we are in spirit and what we need to do in any range of situations, in any range of challenges, in any range of options. We need to do that. We need to be disciplined about it. We need to be detailed about it. Because that's what builds our spiritual awareness. It's like how all of you, most of you, except me, go to the gym religiously every day, or walk on the hill, or go to Emancipation Park and walk. Hmm. Deliberate, detailed, focused. Well, that's the same way in which we build our muscles in spiritual consciousness, so that we manage whatever we have to manage in our lives and affairs. That's the challenge. That's the work that we always have to challenge ourselves to do and be. And what's exciting is that the results just like those who pre in front of the mirror in the gym, the results are also <laughs> very wonderful to demonstrate. So keep building and keep working and have a great week. Thank you. <laughs>